Again, thank you all for coming. I'm John Cavana, and I'm the director of the Institute for Policy Studies. And partly as a result of moving into a new space, we are doing a series of sessions each week on different topics that highlight our work as well as key issues of the day. And today we've we've decided to zero in on one of the more of the issues that's most in the media today, inequality and presidential politics, opportunities for changing the game. Um, before I start, just a couple of logistics. Um, there is there are restrooms right behind the blue wall there. As you came in, yeah, as Elaine said, there's a closed closet there. Um, and we have tea and water and coffee down there a little bit. Uh, but you're not going to fall asleep in this session. <laughs> so, so you won't need that. Um, and let me just say a word more about the series. Uh, so it's, it's once a week. Next week, I th this is really part of a two-part series today. Actually, you can get two for the price of one. So I expect to see you all back here next Tuesday. But today we're going to be looking at inequality and in presidential politics. Next week, we're going to be looking at proposals from IPS and some of our close allies like People's Action on how to transform the economy in a way that's good for people and the planet. Uh, so for this particular session, we are struck here at IPS uh, that inequality has been brought to the fore of the presidential campaign in a way that uh, perhaps has not been the case since um, the 1930s. And in addition, um, if we think of equity more broadly as encompassing uh, economics, but also race and gender, um, those topics are at the center, partly propelled by dynamic movements. Uh, and we're four or five years into the movements that came out of Occupy Wall Street. And we're now a year and a half into the movements that came out of Black Lives Matter, the larger movement for black lives. And so issues that have been central to IPS and to the progressive agenda are, are now front and center. And today we want to talk about that, understand it. I think from us at IPS, just to, to be totally clear, we are we see ourselves as public scholars here. We, we both are trying to understand the world, uh, but change it. So we are also, I'm going to provoke the, my colleagues here also to help us think about spaces where uh, once we understand where the candidates stand and what the issues are, ways that we maybe collectively can push this debate. And uh, so the three folks here are Chuck Collins, who uh, is the founder of United for a Fair Economy uh, a couple of decades ago, has been with IPS almost a decade now, running our inequality and the common good program out of Boston. Uh, then Sarah Anderson, who directs our global economy project uh, and uh, has been working on both domestic and global economy issues here for quite a while. Uh, and you know, we will, there's a space here and a space there, and if any more people come in, we can also put some more chairs up here. Um, I, and I, I have some chairs in my office if we're running low on chairs, I just said. Uh, and there's chairs there. Uh, and Karen Dolan, uh, who directs our criminalization of poverty program, and most recently is the co-author of this study, Mothers at the Gate, How a Powerful Family Movement is Transforming the Juvenile Justice System. Um, and these three, by the way, are part of a larger team at IPS uh, that includes Mark Priester here, Mark Baird, our Black Workers Initiative, Janet Redman, um, our Climate Policy Project, Sam Pizzicotti is here in the back, who, who edits our inequality.org website. A larger team that's working on these related issues and also working with dynamic uh, movements, uh, people's movements that are organizing around these issues, such as uh, people's action. And we can get into who some of the actors are that we work with later on. But we're feeling this is a very exciting time. So I'm going to start in with some questions that pull Chuck and then Sarah and then Karen into the conversation. And then um, about halfway through, Wherever we are in that, I have lots of questions, but I'll just stop and open it up to all of you for a broader conversation. So um, let me start with uh, Chuck. Um, taxes are at the core of rising inequality. 
ta uh, Trump's tax agenda is changing hour by hour. Tell us a little bit about at this moment, as of 12.30 p.m., uh, what, yeah. what are the main elements? I here? forgot to check this morning to see if there was any. Um, actually, just for context, it was, um, I think it was 1999 that Donald Trump proposed a one-time tax on wealth, over $10 million, a 14% tax on wealth. I know this because... I looked at Sam Pizzagotti's article at inequality.org. But so just to show you that Donald Trump, how, how do they say candidates migrate in their positions, uh, that he, you know, 15 years ago was advocating a wealth tax. Later we'll talk about good ideas that should be on the policy agenda. I think that's actually one of them to bring back the Donald Trump wealth tax proposal. Um, he, interestingly enough, has not taken the uh, Americans for Tax Reform, no tax pledge, uh, because, quote, he might want to switch the taxes around a little bit. I think that's the operative frame. Uh, I mean, his, his basic proposal is to reduce income taxes substantially. You know, the income tax uh, currently at the top rate, 39.6%, wants to bring it down to the 25, he wants to take the statutory corporate income tax rate from 35 to 15, wants to eliminate the estate tax. Uh, we know a little bit about the distributional impact of that, but it's essentially a huge windfall for the very top. Uh, it's a, it will cost $10 trillion over the next 10 years. Uh, lately, he's backed off on that a little bit, basically saying he'd like to get that down to about $4 trillion in tax cuts and do something for the middle class to be determined soon. So I think that's, you know, uh, his, his current framing. Um, okay, and let me ask Sarah, is there anything positive in this Trump tax plan uh, that well, we should be excited about? <laughs> First, I have to just say a little bit about something that I heard on the radio over the weekend. I don't know if people here listen to On the Media with Bob uh, Garfield, and you heard the rant that he did at, at I think it was around 7 in the morning on Saturday, and boy, did it ever wake me up. It was a rant about how the um, media had been covering Trump, uh, including uh, people, um, just a second, I'm going to get the exact quote, because it, it was really unlike anything I, I'd, I'd heard uh, before. He was going after Chuck Todd and a lot of the major media figures for, for giving um, Trump a pass. And what he said was, the man is a menace of historic proportions. So who the Chuck Todd cares about his tax proposals? It's like asking Charles Manson about his driving record. <laughs> <laughs> about to start preparing for this brown bag, and I thought, oh my gosh, is that what we're doing? The equivalent of you know asking Charles Manson about his driving record here. Um, so I think you know I, I I took the point that that we should always be putting this in the broader context of the the Trump uh, agenda. At the same time, I think that uh, taxes are a really big deal, and I think Karen's going to talk more about how. If his tax, his latest tax plan were implemented, it really would be devastating for, especially for the poorest people in the country. But you know, if I did have to point to anything that was slightly positive, I would say that um, I think for me the the most meaningful thing he's done is his um, statements about the carried interest loophole, which allows billionaire hedge fund managers to claim the bulk of their income as capital gains and get a 50% tax cut out of that. And so I really enjoyed hearing Trump talk about how these hedge fund managers are making a killing and all they do is pat, you know, shuffle around paper anyway. They don't build stuff and all of that. If you look into the details, though, if he succeeds um, in the goal of lowering the top marginal tax rate as Chuck said he wants to go from 39.6 to uh, 25. Well, capital gains is at 20 now, so if he eliminated the carried interest loophole, we wouldn't really be getting much out of it. Um, we'd, we'd come out you know, worse in the end for sure. So I appreciate the rhetoric that he's been putting out there on that uh, hedge fund uh, loophole, but when you get into the details, it's probably not that meaningful. Okay, now we're going to shift to the Democrats, and as, as you all may know, there's two Democrats left in the race. <laughs> um, and uh, I just want to say, Karen and I were going through our records the other day. IPS in 1991 worked with one of the two remaining uh, Democrats to, to form something called the Congressional Progressive Caucus. 
which now has 74 members, but it was founded by Bernie Sanders exactly 25 years ago. Uh, and then you got four others, and then it grew, and it grew pretty quickly. Uh, actually, it grew in part as a counter to Newt Gingrich's contract with America, wow. thinking back over that time. But we were thinking back of our history uh, here mm -hmm. with, with um, these various candidates. Chuck just gave you his history with Donald Trump, but that's a little bit of our history with, uh, with Bernie Sanders going way back. But uh, yeah, Chuck, could you say a word on how Bernie's plan, tax plan, compares with Hillary's? Well, um, I mean, I think both those plans would actually take a dent in inequality. So if we're, if we're just looking at what's happening to the wealth, the income of the top 1% and the top one-tenth of 1%, um, Hillary's tax proposal would actually sort of raise the average tax rates back up again. So they're, they're at like 21, 23% for the top. Uh, her, her proposals and looking at all of her federal proposals. So she, you know, both Bernie and, and Hillary maintain, you know, maintain the current estate tax. Uh, Bernie Sanders would, would make it more progressive. He wants to add a, a kind of higher rate structure. So the bigger your estate, the higher rate you pay. So he wants to add a graduated feature to the estate tax, which uh, we think is a great idea. Um, Hillary's, Hillary's proposal is, uh, would, would raise the, the top one-tenth of 1%. 1 effective average tax rate would go up to about 39%, uh, up from you know mid-20s or so. Uh, so that's a significant reversal of like, 30 years of tax cuts for the top. Um, Bernie's proposal goes, goes further. He, you know, in addition to a progressive estate tax, he has much higher tax rates. He sort of, as he would say, bring back some of the tax rates of the socialist era of Dwight Eisenhower. Um, so his, the effective average tax rate of, of the one-tenth of 1% 1 under a Sanders federal tax plan would be closer to 63%. So it, it uh, puts a significant break. And that, we're talking millions of dollars of additional taxes paid per year. So I think that's, that's one just quick sort of summary from an inequality perspective. Both, both candidates would make a significant reversal in the, the current trends, and Bernie's proposals go significantly further in terms of taxing the top. And uh, Sarah, I'm curious, are there signs that the Sanders campaign, I mean, both rhetoric and proposals have influenced the Hillary campaign on yeah, I, I think absolutely. So just, I mean, I think he's influenced her in a lot of ways, but just focusing on the tax uh, issues. One thing that uh, Sanders has been hammering on in just about every speech is uh, his idea to tax Wall Street speculation. Um, it's one of the pillars of his campaign. He talks about it as a way to raise revenue for things like making higher education affordable. I think it's been a, a really popular part of his campaign. Uh, Hillary has not taken a position yet on that. Uh, it's noteworthy that she has not come out and been critical of it at all. Uh, but what she did do was come out with a, a kind of a tax or a fee on high frequency trading. You know, now our, our financial markets are dominated by this kind of trading that's done by computers based on algorithms and they're flipping stocks, you know, in the fraction of, of seconds. And But her idea is... Uh, not very strong on details. It would deal only with excessive cancellation of orders. So that's one of the high frequency trading strategies is you, um, you, know, you cancel about uh, 20 times as many orders as you actually fulfill. It's all, it's, you know, they argue it's to create liquidity in the markets. It's mostly about manipulation of the market. So she's trying to get at that small piece of the, the broader problem with excessive speculation in the market. So she, she did come out with that. I kind of, you know, question whether she would have if um, Sanders hadn't been hammering away uh, on that issue. And then another issue where I think she's been pretty good is uh, has to do with offshore tax dodging, getting at a piece of it, which is inversion, you know, when companies by uh, smaller foreign companies for the purpose of tax dodging to, to shift their um, where they're actually registered. And she did come up with a pretty good plan on that. It doesn't take on the whole broader 
a problem of overseas uh, tax dodging like we've you know become more aware of through the Panama Papers and all of that but I think she she did come out with a solid plan on that and and again I, I can't imagine that um, she wasn't somewhat influenced by Bernie's talking about that okay now we're going to shift into um, the broader looking at equity and, and this broader lens of, of also um, race and gender equity and um, and also there it's interesting to watch more and more people talk about the interconnections between these issues um, also with poverty and and mass incarceration so let's go back to Trump and by the way I don't just probably happening to all of you who have friends overseas all of us here are getting tons of requests from people overseas to help us understand Trump uh, so and what a Trump presidency would mean and and I think we like all of you now are taking this possibility very seriously so I want to turn to Karen and and actually ask the question of what an anti-poverty agenda would look like under Trump and, and, and a broader yeah. criminal justice reform agenda to the extent that we know what it well, would look like. Well, first what I was going to do was, you know, go in, in, in that, that vein and then move into some of the racial stuff. And we, when we get into the racial and criminalization stuff, I also wanted to add that this co-author on this report is also Ebony Slaughter Johnson, who's here in the audience, and she's part of our team. Thank you, Ebony. But I think when Sarah was talking about, you know, the good things that um, that that you could say that Trump has, well, these really interesting things at first, and and one of those, well, I found that almost all of them that he's ever been sort of good on, he's completely backtracked on by now, according to what his advisors have told him, and. One of the positive things that made him stand out from some of the Republicans was that he wasn't going to touch Medicare and Social Security. So unlike the other Republicans, he, he, he was appealing to Tea Party and to his base, who really don't want Medicare and Social Security to be dismantled. Uh, however, given his tax proposal that was set to decrease, uh, to cost $9.5 trillion, uh, and I don't know how he's proposing to get it down to $4 trillion. He, I haven't seen the specifics on that, but certainly if he if he made those kind of cuts, he couldn't do that and save Social Security, Medicare, and balance the budget by 2026. And if he tried to do that, um, he would have to cut every single government program by at least two fifths. And if he if he tried to preserve if he tried to preserve Social Security and Medicare and balance the budget. He would have to eliminate every single government program. Every single safety net program would be gone. There would be absolutely no funding for it. So it's completely illogical. And so his safety net program would be nothing. There would be no safety net program. And, and other than his lip service about preserving Social Security and Medicare, he has just been as flamboyant as anything else on social safety net programs. He thinks that uh, teen mothers should not be allowed to access welfare. They should be put into group homes and taken care of by religious uh, institutions. He thinks lack of work makes people dependent on welfare. Uh, he isn't <coughs> for that. He's for faith-based solutions uh, to some of these issues. He used to be for the legalization of drugs was a, a kind of a, a progressive and uh, forward-thinking answer. He, you know, he's backtracked on that now, so now that, now that he isn't. So uh, he, so his safety net program is almost non-existent. And then the other piece that, that I would, and, and, Hillary and Hillary and Bernie are virtually the same um, on most of the social safety net programs, except that Bernie would have a single-payer health care. Medicare for all, which be, which would be a significant uh, increase in in uh, anti, as an anti-poverty measure, and you know would have really long long-reaching effects. So, uh, and he's he's better on legalizing drugs, and that would bring us to the issue of criminal justice reform. And I think that you know this is to me it's really important when we talk about inequality. I have a little handout. Um, Make sure I get one. You might have to have to uh, share it. But even when we talk about the social safety net program and the tax reform pieces, if we don't really talk about mass incarceration, um, overcriminalization of 
criminalization of black populations, Latino populations, what having these criminal records do to the rest of the country, we're not going to be able to address inequality or poverty or racial justice. So we have about 70 to 100 million people in the US with criminal records. And if you have a criminal record, you have significant obstacles to getting a job. So even if the, even if the minimum wage was raised to $15 an hour, that doesn't necessarily help you if you can't get a job. And sometimes this is lifelong, that it has you know, uh, either at last lack of access to a job or lifelong reduction in, uh, in income. And of course, mass incarceration is disproportionately affects black populations and Latino populations. So until we can fix that, we're still talking about impoverishing 60% of black and Latino populations. And it's not just the person that's incarcerated. So the family bears the brunt of costs. And it turns out that a family member with an incarcerated person, uh, with an incarcerated loved one, can have up to, I think it's like a six, at least 50% or a little over 50% of them can't afford basic needs. So it's really very drastic and very severe. And when you look at, and, and, and it lists out a few more um, of these statistics on the piece of paper that, that I uh, handed out to you, and 83% of these huge costs that are put on families are born primarily, are born by women, and primarily black and Latina women. So it's a real problem, and especially as the country is becoming more black, more brown, more immigrant, uh, we are impoverishing a whole generation. Uh, so in addition to having to do the kinds of smart proposals that Bernie and, and when pushed Hillary have, uh, we also have to really look at ma mass incarceration, which both Bernie and Hillary do have, are, are, are quite smart on that. They're both relatively new to, to these positions. Hillary has done sort of a complete flip-flop from her tough on crime days and calling black youth super predators. Bernie has been more consistent yet, but it hasn't been a real focal point of his really until the um, until the election. So they both have really good instincts on it. Bernie would decriminalize uh, marijuana, which would do a great deal to cut down on on the prison population. And Trump, you know, Trump has said lethal injection is too comfortable. Mm. So you can tell a lot, and he said that the most misunderstood and the most maltreated people in the United States are police officers. So if you look at those two statements, you get an idea of what would happen um, under a Trump presidency to one of the most pressing problems that's really a driver <coughs> of racial uh, and economic inequality in the US. Yeah, I'm curious, you've gotten a bit, uh, you've gotten into all three candidates on these things. But I'm just back to anti-poverty programs for a moment with the Democrats, um, uh, Bernie and Hillary. I'm curious. You know, you've said a little bit about how they differ. I know the other thing that's that's been big in the debates is is Bernie being for fifteen dollar, uh, you know, for all people, uh, uh, raising the minimum wage to fifteen for all, and mm -hmm. Hillary having a quote more nuanced position on that. But um, on the anti-poverty part of of Hillary versus Bernie, uh, you know, any other differences? Well, I think medic. As I said, I think the Medicare for all. I think the health care is the biggest difference. Uh, and and I, Hillary, as far as I know, hasn't come out to, to raise the cap on Social Security. So I think that Social Security and Medicaid are probably the biggest social safety net differences. And they are, those are significant in terms of how they would help poor and low-income people. Great. OK, so I just one final little round here. I want to get a bit into um, how to you know, that's a little bit the state of the debate in presidential politics. And of course, there's there's uh, Senate races, House races, all the way down to school board races going on all over the country. And if you all want to get into that in the conversation, we, we'd love to do that. But now, getting a little bit into the role we can all play in this. I'm curious, going back to you, Chuck, um, what you'd like to see the candidates take up on taxes that they aren't. And I, I will just note, in the back of the room, there is, um, there's Karen's two reports that Karen has taken the lead on, uh, Karen and Abby, but this one, Mothers at the Gate. And there is also, by the way, there's also, I'm going to send this around, there's a sign-up sheet for, you're into these issues and want to get deeper in, um, as I mentioned, well, you should 
sign up for the IPS website uh, and get our weekly uh, updates. But also we have the website on inequality, inequality.org. Um, and I just want to pass around the sign up sheet for that. Uh, and back there also is a is a piece, a special issue that uh, folks here took the lead on um, in the nation called Game Changers, how, how we can unrig the rules and reverse runaway inequality. So let me turn it back to you, Chuck. I think the question is, uh, what? so I mean, I think that in terms of revenue proposals, I think the San Bernie Sanders has sort of staked out, he, you know, he's made this financial transaction tax, uh, progressive uh, estate tax. Uh, I would, I guess I would like to see the Trump wealth tax on the agenda. I think actually having a discussion about net worth taxes, not just at the, uh, you know, the end of life and estate tax, but an annual net worth tax, we're, I think we're ready. I mean, it, there's, we have to do something to slow the concentration of wealth and power at the top. And uh, we can raise the floor, but at a certain point, you have to address that incredible concentration. Um, one of the things that I think Sanders has done well is sort of linking something popular. So in the case of, uh, you know, let's, you know, debt-free education, tuition-free college, linking that to a pay for, in this case, the financial transaction tax, a Wall Street transaction linking those together. Uh, and I've seen that in uh, Hillary's proposals. She basically says, you know, infrastructure paid for by closing business loopholes. Uh, and I think that, that that is a kind of points the way toward not so much more policies. I think we could come up with a good list, but how do you actually build a constituency for some of these policies? So in this issue of the nation, we we talk about what would, what would it take to, to change the game a little bit. Uh, what and a game-changing proposal in our definition was three parts of it. You know, does it actually slow the concentration of wealth and power? Does it generate revenue to fund something that has wide popular appeal that people can get excited about, and therefore does it mobilize or bring a constituency with it? And I would say that the most important thing, and this you know, it was this proposal. That Sanders put forward for you know, tuition-free uh, education, higher education, funded by this pay-for, and I think more proposals like that. Uh, in Washington State, they actually have their state estate tax revenue goes to something called an Education Legacy Trust Fund that funds the community college tuition-free community college in the state of Washington. And when the anti-tax people went to the ballot to try to get rid of that. 62% of Washington state voters voted to keep their state estate tax, which Washington state is an anti-tax state, doesn't have an income tax. Most of those anti-tax initiatives win. So the fact that it was linked to something popular. So I think that in a way that's a little bit of a, a clue, you know, so institute a carbon tax, tax um, luxury consumption, and link that revenue toward green infrastructure, something that then brings a constituency with it to fight for it and defend it. So those are a couple of things I think that in addition to having more, you know, a wealth tax, just sort of thinking from a campaign constituency point of view. How do you li liven up? Because one of the problems I think is people are, you know, we're talking about these very lowered expectations uh, and not what's something big and bold that could be done, like after World War II. You know, let's the, you know debt-free education and build uh, infrastructure at a very high level. Now, so I think I think we need to sort of animate younger and, and new constituencies. So I think that's one. I would just add, I think another way to make tax reforms more popular, and in addition to linking them to key constituencies and what you use the revenue for, is to link them to uh, CEO pay. So the polling shows that if you can say that um, by making this tax reform, you'll also rein in CEO pay, it, the, the popularity goes way up. People across the political spectrum are outraged about uh, CEO pay. Um, I was just reading a quote from Trump last fall that I, I totally missed because I wasn't taking him seriously at the time, I guess. But he went on and on about how he thought it was just disgusting and obscene how, how high the CEO pay levels have gotten. So. 
all three of the remaining political candidates are already there in terms of their rhetoric about obscene uh, CEO pay, but they should come together around a, the principle that ordinary taxpayers should not be subsidizing executive pay. It's one thing we also lift up in the Nation article. There are a number of ways, in addition to carried interest, there are other ways that there are tax loopholes that encourage excessive executive pay. Uh, the rest of us get stuck with the bill when CEOs and, and their employers don't pay their fair taxes. And I think that would be a, a really winning um, message that could cut across um, the partisan lines. So Karen, do you want to say anything about what some of these proposed, especially the tax policy changes, might have on poverty and on uh, the race class intersection? Yeah, well, I think I did in terms of what Trump's proposals would have, which right. is a devastating effect. But um, in terms of activism, if you, you know, in addition to the the great efforts to to have these tax reforms um, and which also opens up more revenue because that's what we need is revenue is looking at um, some of again the effects of incarceration mass incarceration and, and some of the costs that are associated with it so we it's 80 billion dollars a year to sustain the highest uh, number of people incarcerated in one country in the world we incarcerate more people than any other country 80 billion dollars a year <laughs> And we have an estimated loss to the GDP, loss to our economy from from of 65 billion for people not working. Now, if we reinvested that that lost revenue in things like alternatives to incarceration, and especially for children to end end the the incarceration of juveniles, which is where so much of your involvement with the system starts there, and invest that in education and re community reinvestment because with the, the tax policies, even as they've been, you know, under Democratic presidents and even under Obama, we, we that, that gap, that inequality gap keeps growing. So we have more and more communities that are high income, uh, I'm sorry, high poverty and high concentrations of black and Latino populations and, and high rates of incarceration from stemming from schools. Um, and, and so the money that's, that's spent there, if we could reinvest the money in communities that really need it, we can do a lot to, um, to address the income inequality uh, problems that we have, the racial inequality problems that we have. And then when people don't, are not involved in the system, then they can take advantage of jobs and job training and job placement, and they can access the safety net as long as they've got, they're in the system or they have criminal records. They can't access any of those. Okay, finally, let me just ask, and then we'll open it up to all of you. Um, you started to get a little bit into this, each of you, but it's preparing for the next presidents. Um, we all know, I mean, everyone in this room was around eight years ago when Barack Obama was elected. And I think, I'll just say for, from IPS's standpoint and many of our allies, we are incredibly self-critical that in his first two years, when actually there was a Democrat, just to remind you, Democratic Senate, House, and President. Uh, and many of us were thinking, oh my God, that's sort of a magic thing that if we think of the two years in the Roosevelt in the 30s when we got all the labor reforms and the two years in the Johnson years where we got all the, the civil rights and other uh, reforms. <laughs> and what we were self-critical about is he was elected, we all cheered, and we didn't do a heck of a lot to push him. Uh, and the other side did a lot to push against him. And we got a lot less in those two years. <clears throat> so uh, let me, let's first, in preparing for either a Hillary or a Bernie presidency, um, I'm curious if you think around these issues, maybe starting back again with you, Chuck, um, if, <laughs> if a, a lot of our groups came together, IPS mm -hmm. and People's Action and the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the Restaurant Workers and so on, um, around something that we could fight for that we could press either of them and, and beat back the inevitable giant backlash from the corporate and 1% Wall Street side. Um, what do you think we should come together around to, to prepare for some wins? Uh, and maybe not just small wins, but bigger wins. <laughs> big, Chuck, big. Well, I, I think that... Um, 
e either whatever happens with Bernie Sanders, I think that part of the challenge is how do you keep together what's been mobilized, what's been built. So, you know, I call it political revolution 2.0. Uh, and what I think I like about what Sanders talks about is his theory of change, which is, look, I'm just going to be running for president. What we actually need is this movement. So, you know, at the Philadelphia town hall meeting, he was asked, you know, about the sort of inside outside question. What what's the role of outside movements with a president if you're a president? And he said, he said, it's absolutely key. Let me tell you one thing. He says, one thing I know for certain, 100 <laughs> percent. If if all the students who have fifty, seventy thousand dollars in debt, if they stood up and organized and demanded, you know, it would happen. It would change the face of America. And I, he, I think he's absolutely right. That's his theory. Changes, you, you know, given the current capture of Congress and the current political constellation, you have to animate and engage a whole new group of people in addition to the people who are already engaged. So I think. Uh, you know, keeping the band together. You know, I think what you said, John, after Obama was elected, the Democratic National Committee and the Obama campaign almost effectively demobilized. All those people they said, go home. We don't need you. We're, we got it. We're, we're going to take care of it. And that was the moment, if you read Dark Money by Jane Meyer, that you realize that the, they sat down and said, how do we spend, you know, $900 you know, million dollars to destroy this agenda? So at the moment that the Democratic and the progressives are demobilizing institutionally, the opposition is remobilizing. So the, the takeaway, no matter what, is how do you maintain that a permanent political formation? The Sanders campaign owes nothing to the Democratic National Committee. There's no, they, they don't have to do a, like a Dean for America or, you know, they could actually say, we're going to keep this aggregator of small donations and people power together. And then the question is, you pick a couple of things that are going to engage people. So clearly student debt. You've got 40 million households that hold student debt. The, the average student debt for graduates, you know, here we are in May, this year's graduating class, $37,000 is the average student debt for the graduates this year. That's a constituency. It's a huge constituency. Uh, so we need Sanders to be barnstorming campuses and animating and engaging that that constituency, whether he's the nominee or not. Same thing, uh, Citizens United or something that's related to campaign finance reform and probably uh, something related to climate change. Those three issues, but we can talk about this, if we focus those and say let's engage and animate some constituencies, that, that could have a huge impact on the on the that could help with the realignment. We know that the base of voters is much more progressive than Congress. So there needs to be some realignment. And the question is how does that realignment happen? So I think that sort of getting into the mental mode of like we're in, we need to sort of maintain a permanent campaign mode, if we will, uh, to to help push this agenda any kind of agenda forward. Excuse so, me, somebody's cell phone Really? Please silence your cell phones. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm yes, not. Sarah, I'm, yeah. I'm also on Wall Street. I'm yeah, serious. yeah. I, Where well, can we win? First of all, I'm not going to try to imitate Hillary Clinton. Um, <laughs> Chuck can do Sanders better than her, but I'm really curious to know what she's going to say about trade, um, especially once Trump starts um, beating her over the head about that in the debates. Um, I do think that there is a potential there for building a very diverse movement for a really different approach to, to trade policy, and we should try to build on that. Um, on she And she did say recently that she does not want a lame duck vote on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, so she's already changing her um, um, her statements a bit on trade. So we'll see where that goes. We're seeing an, an evolution there. Um, on Wall Street, uh, you know, the, the question of the day on every issue is how do we keep the momentum going from um, the election process? Um, it's been really amazing to see the mobilizations that, that we've been seeing around uh, key issues on the progressive agenda. 
Um, and everyone's trying to figure out how to keep that going. One effort along those lines is a new campaign that will launch next week, uh, May 24th, called uh, Take on Wall Street. Um, it ha will unite um, all the major labor unions, uh, consumer, anti-poverty, economic justice, and other organizations, and more tightly coordinate work that's been going on for some time here in D.C. around policy issues with more of a grassroots um, organizing uh, strategy to it and, and more media attention. It has five priorities. One is the financial transaction tax, or as Bernie calls it, the Wall Street speculation tax. Um, two others deal with CEO pay tax issues, carried interest, and there's another CEO pay uh, loophole. One is breaking up the banks, and one is um, alternatives to the big banks through a postal banking and, and uh, reining in the payday lenders, that kind of thing. So this is, you know, just one of, I think, what we'll see uh, of s numerous efforts to try to take people who have gotten mobilized around the campaigns. We can see now that people are still angry about the financial crisis, still want to take on Wall Street, and giving them opportunities for acting on that. And finally, Karen, you got the more fun one here. Th those are easy to prepare for. Preparing for a Trump presidency here. Um, you know, you put, painted a little bit of a sense of what it, a Trump presidency might mean for poverty and racial justice, but um, thoughts on how we prepare for that? And well, can I answer the question of what we need to do to keep that sure. <laughs> momentum going? I mean, I would add to that that we also have to um, in addition to that, we have to talk about reenfranchisement. We have to talk about voter ID laws. We have to talk about black and brown people getting the vote back because until we can reenfranchise people, or then we're not we're going to be in this in this same position over and over again. So I think that there's a lot of momentum around voting rights, um, getting rid of the voter ID laws. And actually being more radical and looking at restoring voting rights to people who are in prison. Uh, people who are in prison should have the right to vote. They're serving their time in prison, and they should be able to vote. And in Massachusetts and Maine, they can. And we talk about student debt, but also legal debt. So legal debt is just drawing folks under, especially African Americans and Latinos, uh, and their whole families and communities end up in this really egregious debt. And as we have a society that's becoming less middle class, less white, we have more and more people that are struggling with legal debt instead of college debt because they're not even able to get into college. So these are some of the more foundational things that I think that we have to add on to some of the other um, great uh, efforts that people are doing. But that has to be part of any political uh, revolution and also immigration reform. So we've got kids, you know, languishing on cement floors in detention centers in the United States. Thousands, tens and thousands of children sleeping on concrete slabs. We have children in uh, solitary confinement shackled uh, in conditions that the, U that the UN calls, uh, you know, uh, 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 torture. They call it torture. So we're torturing, you know, up to 60,000 kids. Uh, in this country at a, at a tremendous financial cost as well. So I think that all of those have to be part of sustaining a political revolution is, is looking at some of the sort of below the surface people that are even below what we're talking about where about accessing welfare uh, benefits or uh, these questions of incarceration um, and disenfranchisement and to prepare for a Trump Presidency, I don't really even want to think about it, but it's the same thing. It's that we've got to be working, whether it's Bernie or Hillary or Trump. These are all the things that have to be done. We may have to push Hillary just as hard uh, on many of these issues. Like I said, Trump has had these things in the past where he says that drugs should be should be legalized, that mass incarceration is a problem, that unarmed people shouldn't be shot in the back. He also has completely contradictory rhetoric that he's employing now, but, you know, find those, God forbid, if we had a Trump <laughs> presidency, find those uh, past uh, proclamations and use those as inroads. But I think we have to do all of it as social movements uh, and not, not rely on whomever it is who gets elected. Thank you. Okay, so let's open it up now. We've got 40 minutes, actually, for conversation. So uh, just raise your hand and I'll 
And, and if there's a lot of people, we'll take several together. But let's start over here, and we'll move our way across the room. Yeah. Kudos to IPS uh, for carrying on this discussion. And, uh, also for starting on like, a very kind of practical training. Pumping taxes is very, very good. And uh, then getting to what Chuck's talking about in terms of uh, invigorating the debate, carrying uh, it forward on a campaign basis. I think Sarah. Um, Put her finger on something very important in talking about the uh, uh, CEO worker pay gaps. Um, but I think therein lies the possibility for, for, for making it something more than just a kind of difficult to carry to the people wonkish kind of uh, uh, platform, uh, which I totally support. Look at very interest uh, issues and, 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 and yeah, let's tax the you know, capital gains and, and, and et cetera. And maybe there's a loophole with regard to incentivizing massive CEO worker pay gaps that, that we can attack. But does that really get us to what is something that is, 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 is popular that invigorates, just like Chuck is talking about, that, that carries us forward, um, uh, you know, maybe for what's more than just the next campaign and the next, but some of it's you know, almost generational. Uh, yeah, tax reform, but focusing on that CEO pay uh, gap with workers, uh, the obscene level, but we actually restructure our, 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 our focus on corporate taxes. The whole thing, I mean, that was great, but, but business and corporate taxes to actually make a, a, a series of reforms that would make it punitive simply because of, 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 of you know, that, that, that gap that you would pay a whole different tax rate when you're, when you're, your CEO worker rate is 100 to 1. For the worker on the floor, um, uh, this is simple. It's something people can get around. It looks to equality. I mean, hey, it takes us right back to, 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 to you know, uh, Occupy Wall Street. Yeah, we wanted to Occupy Wall Street. We wanted to end it overnight, but that's a tough one to bring forward in, in, in the legislature. But this is something, yeah, it's not for tomorrow, it's not for the next day, but we could actually structure something around that that continues to invigorate, that propels people, uh, uh, brings in workers. In the Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because if people don't know, there was a victory last summer where we got the SEC to finally um, finalize this rule in Dodd-Frank to require companies to disclose the ratio between their CEO and worker pay. Now we want to do exactly what you're talking about, which is put teeth in that, tie it to tax rates. So the wider your gap, the higher your tax rate. We want to put it in procurement policy. So you'll have a better chance of getting a government contractor if you have a smaller gap. So yeah, I think those ideas can build on the living wage movement and the fight for 15 movement, but tying it also to the top end of the wage problem. Yeah, uh, yeah I was, Karen would bring up a single payer Medicare for all. That's one of her favorite topics. But yeah. she, she mentioned it. She mentioned it. She she what she did bring in. up was important too. Yeah. But, you know, how many times a day do I hear people say oh, Obamacare got 20 million more people on health insurance without saying, well, yeah, but he left, he left 20 million uninsured and twice as many, but I would say three or four times as many underinsured. And uh, yesterday, Gallup Polk came out and said that a solid majority of people are, are for a single payer program. Uh, the American public is just undereducated on on single payer, and what it does is propagandized into thinking that it would be costly. Uh, you know, uh, NP, uh, um, PNHP's uh, policy guy, Don McCann, puts out a daily thing called Quarter of the Day, and, and, and that can, you know, to, to publicize the things that he says, which educate people on the facts about the healthcare system and, and how single payer can solve so many things. Including the poverty issue, that that's 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 an issue that I like to see push more. Great. Why don't we do a couple more and then we'll turn back here for yeah over here in the front and. Um, we don't have enough firepower to do very much of this stuff. I think we have to recognize first of all that we have a polarized political system based on geography, and that. It is not likely, even if we take the Senate back, we will have enough power to, to do anything in the House. That's the first thing. The second thing is a lot of these things are symbolic. 
Yes, raise the rate on, on uh, CEO pay. Okay, what does that do? It makes people feel a little bit better, but it doesn't solve the inequality problem. I mean, there's so many things that have been done over the last 30 or 40 years under the table. Things just like taking the lid off user fees, things like restructuring the bankruptcy laws, all of those things are under the table that you, you will need years and years. The thing I think that we have to recognize is that a lot of the harms that we have from inequality are local. For example, you could live in a you could live in a place like San Francisco, New York City, where things are are highly unequal. Gene coefficients are huge, but they have the social services there to ameliorate some of that. Um, it seems to me that that what we need to do is we need to find ways to, to give people uh, more of a, a democratic identity, get them to show up not just to vote for Bernie or vote for Hillary. I mean, that, that's important because we'll get a Supreme Court justice after. But we need to show up in midterms. I mean, and until you can do that, you're not born. Yeah, we'll take one more and then get responses from okay. uh, all of you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on what you were saying. Uh, Karen, I'm glad you did bring up single payer. Um, I want to tell you what happened this past Saturday in Virginia at the 11th Congressional District Convention. There was a Medicare for All resolution. We were outnumbered, I was a Bernie delegate, outnumbered two to one by the Hillary delegates. There was an attempt to take out the Medicare for All. There was a discussion. The, the Hillary person said that this costs more than Bernie's proposal. And the Bernie delegate said, no, it actually might have cost me less. It passed overwhelmingly. Uh, and Hillary has recently come out uh, and said that she's for, uh, kind of vague in my mind, but something like uh, Medicare option down to age 50 or 55. <laughs> and even Donald Trump has said, he wants to eliminate Obamacare, but he has said everybody should have health care. So what do you guys think of whether or not there could actually be momentum? Now that Bernie has gotten the genie out of the bottle and single payer is actually being discussed widely in this country uh, as versus the way it was suppressed in the 2010 debate, you know, is it possible that the public mood can be translated into political reality? Great, great question. So, yeah, why don't you each, Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think the public mood can be translated into political reality. The pharmaceutical company is too big. Hillary is hand in glove with the pharmaceutical company, so she's only going to go so far with her her leanings toward expanding Medicare very far. Um, and Donald Trump can't. He can say that all he wants, but he can't. When push comes to shove, is he going to not uh, give tax breaks to his friends or not be pushed uh, you know, with the wealthy and powerful people and care about poor people that he thinks should be taken care of by churches? No. I mean, he's, he's, he doesn't actually care about the other people. He's not going to pass Medicare for all. I mean, in my opinion, um, and I and I agree with with you on um, on voting. And, and I think it's not only I think it's very local. So I do think it's you know state based of closing down prisons, getting rid of private prisons, having that come from the federal government. It's got to be at the federal level, and that helps at the state and local level. You have to get profit out of prisons, and you have to reenfranchise people, and you have to give people the vote. Um, yes, and I, I mean that I'm talking in addition to all the the proposals that were that were put on the table that are are the sort of bread and butter of the Democratic Party, but. Um, some of these other issues are really going to affect things at the ballot box. Yeah. Yeah. In response to the skunk at the picnic, um, yeah, we can't be too rosy about what we can achieve in here in Washington. And so one thing that we do do a lot of is trying to figure out how to um, promote some of these ideas as models at the state and local level. Um, so one interesting development is around carried interest. They're trying to push that in New York State, um, Chuck State of Massachusetts, Connecticut. There are a couple of others. I think that's really interesting to say, 
Congress, you're not going to take care of this. We're going to do it um, at the state level. So we'll see where that goes. Some of the CEO pay reforms I mentioned too, we're trying to um, help support efforts to do those at the state level. Rhode Island is looking at a CEO to worker pay ratio bill related to um, state contracting. So yeah, I, no, no matter, you know, like you said, if we get, if the Democrats retake the Senate and all, we're still facing an uphill battle here in DC. Only thing I would add, I, I agree. We sort of have two sort of election cycles. There's the presidential elections with this huge turnout, and then there are these midterm elections. And I think that the, the test of our, the success of the political revolution 2.0 will be that midterm election. I think that's a really good barometer of whether, because here's what we know. We know that these inequalities cut very deeply. We know that the base of the electorate want to raise a minimum wage, want to uh, tax the wealthy, tax millionaires at much higher levels. These things pull, no, there, there's sort of a deepening understanding of how these inequalities matter. You know, we as a society have a very high tolerance for inequality as long as people believe that the rules are fair and there's social mobility. Now that there's declining social mobility and it's clear that the rules are rigged, people are much more attuned to these inequality issues. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders, when I, I worked with him first when he was the mayor of Burlington on housing issues, and I was listening to like one of his speeches from 1984, it sounds exactly the same. He's saying the same thing. He's talking, he's talking about the 1% and wealth, and, and now people are animated by it. And I think what's changed is after the economic meltdown, there has been a realignment. It's it hasn't it isn't reflected in our national politics yet, so I think that's where you know engaging younger voters. I think that you know I have I have you know three college age kids. They are just completely all in for Bernie. Mm -hmm. They're you know one of them is like registering voters and turned out sixty voters in Indiana. Be, mm -hmm. Why is that? Why are they so in part because he speaks the truth because he's talking about their how these inequalities are affecting young people. Student debt just being one way, but young workers, the whole, whole experience. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the measure of our success will be how much can we keep some of that energy and infrastructure and fundraising and volunteer mobilization together. And already you can see there are, you know, I like that Sanders has identified uh, other down ballot candidates and. Zephyr Teach out in New York and Pramila Jamal in Washington State running for Congress. So trying to sort of bring along more people, I think that's very optimistic. At some point, there's going to have to be a realignment. It could be this, the Trump realignment, you know, or there's this creative destruction in the Republican Party, and then there's this other dynamic. So I think it's a very volatile time, but I actually think it's, there's tremendous possibility for a positive realignment. In the next. Yeah, so opening up, and you, you guys, all of you should say whatever it is you want to say, but I just, these questions have raised something I just want to put on the table that is central to our discussions here at IPS, which is these proposals we've all been talking about are very popular. And as Chuck has mentioned, there's a growing sense that the rules are rigged, so that the, the sense of tolerance of the horrible rigged rules we have uh, there's a sense of growing frustration. And so the interesting question in many ways is the one you raised, which is how you build power to win things and where. And we are quite focused on the 10 states where you can win things and the cities where you can win things. And we're, we're very attuned to the fact that you need to link that to a national agenda. But um, so we, we'd love any thoughts on how you think we sh should all collectively pursue these battles in a way that builds our power in places where we can win things, in addition to the comments you just made about voting. So yeah, go ahead. You and then. Kind of on that vein, uh, the politics of it, uh, as we see with the minimum wage fight, you know, $15, people are scoffing at it, and, and the South and areas where, you know, you don't need to make $15 to, to get your basic necessities. Um, do you think, is it a question of if or when the 
the progressive movement makes the shift to talk about universal based income and how high are we going to have to see a minimum wage be in place you know in urban centers that it's going to be you know we can't be can we run a campaign saying we need a 25 dollar minimum wage you know is that going to be a thing that, that we're going to be able to do with offshore out, outsourcing offshore and, 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 and yeah, I, I think what you said about your kids is, of course, was very exciting. But the real question is, after the election, are they still going to be involved? Um, if they died after the was elected, that's the, mid the midterm question. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if there's any way that Bernie does not win the nomination, if there's any way you can keep him involved as a spokesman, they keep screaming. People will listen to him and will follow him. And if he stops, this is going to go. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it sounds like we should be having a discussion because the call in there says opportunities for changing the game. And so I came here thinking about I'm going to get tips on changing the game. And what I got mostly was a description of what was going on. I mean, there's been some tips, right? It sounds like we need to support the movement and keep the movement supported, is what needs to happen. If Trump were elected, that would keep the movement supported, right? Because, if, and, and, and what you're talking about when Obama came in, and if Bernie were to get in, you know, it's, there's a certain type of co-option there. We're all going to go home. It's like when the EPA got created, right? The, the environmental movement all went home. Oh, the government's going to take care of it, right? So I think what we need to ask is how do we support the movement besides that? And one of the things is, you mentioned young people, biographical availability, the term they use in social movements, which is, Retired folks, look mm. around the room a little bit here. You got really young folks and you got really older folks because everybody else is raising their kids and working really hard and doesn't have time for this kind of stuff. So <laughs> I'm just wondering, can we brainstorm a bit more about how do we, and I feel like I'm getting a little bit radicalized myself slowly because I see like the only thing that's gonna do anything is the social movement. Mm. I got arrested last month, part of Democracy Spring, and uh, they dropped charges on me. I said, I'm not paying a fine because I want my democracy back. You know, and then they drop charges on me. So I'm just, you know, looking for the next chance to, you know, make a stink and get hit the streets. Because now this is a question: Would Trump? Trump seems to be very um, susceptible to what people think of him. And if Trump was in office, would you know a movement get him to, you know, look how wishy washy and changing his mind on all these kinds of things? I don't know. Right, we're, we're, yeah, behind you there, uh, and then we'll get you the next. Axing the top, which is, which is great. I guess. I print Sam columns in my newsletter all the time. But I'd like to talk about the other. What can we do about the taxes that are still imposed on the folks on the bottom? I'm thinking of things like payroll tax, I'm thinking of things like sales taxes, I'm thinking of things like sin taxes, if you will. These are the ones that disproportionately hit the folks who really burn. Great. Uh, talk about talk about that when we talk about that. Which of you wants to start? Chuck said he'd take the bottom. Oh, just on the bottom one. Yeah. I think you're right. I think that there's an opportunity to bring in, bring back some of the, these progressive tax proposals by offsetting the more regressive things. So, I mean, obviously dealing with the payroll tax, you know, cap, um, but also things that you know, substituting regressive consumption taxes with progressive consumption taxes. So why do we tax private jets, not soda? You know, Look at who actually pays the real costs. So I think that there's some tax shifting uh, work that is being you know, piloted in state and local areas. Um, the, the, the other thing I would just say is I, I, you know, the conversations that we have, and we're nonpartisan, 501c3, yada, yada, you know. But um, the, the, you know, those of us who kind of work with people in the Sanders campaign who are thinking about the next steps. I think the one thing that people all understand is you said keep keep Bernie on the road, right? You you keep the aggregator together. Let's say you even if you just raise a fifth of the money that's been raised in the last year and you devote that to a campus organizer on every campus for political revolution 2.0 and a congressional organizer in a number of specific congressional districts and they're Barnes, you know, they're basic, and Bernie's basically on the road, and and he's and he's bringing in more people, the Zephyr teachouts and the Pramila, you know, he's bringing in other people along, and he's sort of transitioning that, 
mobilization force, if you will, that's to me one of the most strategic things that could happen. I think in keeping keeping students engaged for the midterms, looking at state redistricting fights, sort of taking it to all those different levels. So I think that's that's a there's a higher likelihood of that happening than after any other election than in my lifetime of some formation staying together, I think, to do that. Um, and I also, yeah, I agree with this sort of young and there's the the, the retiree, the boom, the radical boomers, man, people are waiting to be called. They're waiting to be invited to something bigger, bolder, and more radical. And I think that the combination of those two, uh, I think, is going to be a big oomph in the political realignment ahead. All right. Sure, Karen, well, you want to Yeah, maybe in response to the universal basic income, I mean, just thanks for bringing that up. I think, you know, many of us are super excited about the momentum we are seeing around Fight for 15, but, um, you know, what do... What do they do in those campaigns when they've won 15? Uh, what's the next step? You always got to be thinking of the bigger thing and universal basic income for, uh, for people who are you know, long-term employed, uh, part of the structural unemployment problem. You know, if they don't have a job, they're not going to benefit from the fight, fight for 15. What about the areas where Fight for 15 is completely off the table? Um, one of our allies, uh, National People's Action, now part of the bigger merged People's Action, is. Uh, along with Jobs of Justice, promoting the idea of a low-wage employer fee, where if you are a big employer that pays your workers so little they have to rely on uh, the social safety net, then you are assessed a fee that goes into a fund that can be used for you know training and, and other things with uh, workers helping to decide how to spend the money. Um, I think it's a, a really important th thing to be thinking through Fight for 15 and beyond, and, and what to do in places where they're not going to get it. Well, can yeah. I just add that that was um, that Justin Striegel asked that question from Patriotic Millionaires, which to me is another one of the interesting things in the constellation here. So, Patriotic Millionaires as a as an ally, you know, we work closely with them. They're in this carried interest fight at the state level. We have you know. CEOs of businesses, high net worth individuals basically showing up and lobbying and advocating for all the progressive tax policies we're talking about, fight for 15, reducing the influence of politics. So organizing the small businesses, there's sort of an alignment there. And this patriotic millionaires group is, I think, has huge communications impact in this in these debates that we're part of. So Yeah, and I think you know, with the universal income, I think that's that's the right Thing. I think we're going to have to do that anyway as society becomes more technological. But also remember, so with all of these, with all of these proposals, remember in that universal uh, income, you have to include formerly incarcerated people. Uh, it's there. It, it's almost one third of all Americans have a criminal record. This is not a small amount of people. And one in three black men in their lives will be incarcerated. So this is just huge. It can't be an add-on. We have to always think about that. So when we're thinking about people that are unemployed, not just because the economy is bad or they're not skilled enough, but because they have a criminal record and that's overwhelmingly black and brown people. And again, we are increasingly a black and brown society and decreasingly white society. And I think that also goes to the thing of, of the social movements. So one of the most vibrant movements, and it's defined in all different ways, but locally, as you're just saying, with the Black Lives Matter or people that are working against police brutality, mass incarceration, shutting down child prisons, ending police brutality, these kinds of issues, and people that are working for reentry, that are trying to take away those barriers to social safety net programs, take away the barriers to work, get real education inside jail, have real preparation so that when they come outside of jail, they can be incorporated into society. These are being led by the people most, infect, most affected, formerly incarcerated people, people with incarcerated loved ones. So all of the movements that we're talking about should be informed by those very vibrant movements. And, there, and talk about young people. There they are. And, and transgender rights. We may not always think about that as a necessarily an economic issue, but nobody's more impoverished in this country than black transgender females. Let me tell you that right now. And the, and the, the window is open. You can't turn on the TV or listen without that coming up. So these are issues, and the LGBT community has had tremendous success in the last few years at breathtaking speeds. And it's because 
They're in our families. We know them. They're leading it themselves. So that's another thing that I think that some of our more economistic movements, our more white middle class movements, can learn from. And if we always keep that in mind as we're going forward, I think it's going to help us. That's great. Okay, so we have time for one last round. And uh, start in the back with Larry, and then over here. Um, I wanted to pick up from where Giving some very specific ideas about uh, what this formation of the ground will look like after the election. Uh, we have a plethora of organizations calling. Uh, there's a people's summit coming up in Chicago, Democracy in Spring, Democracy in Awakening, uh, People's Action, Progressive Ends of Earth. I have a question. Is there anybody uh, looking at the various uh, roots from which a progressive formation on the ground can spread is really studying that from an organizational point of view, not from an issues point of view, and working to figure out how to bring these people together, at least some extent, so that formation on the ground can be the same thing. Is there work being done on that? Good. Yes, over here. Yeah, well, um, you know, this is all good discussion, and the um, question of uh, political revolution, that was, you know, that was raised. I mean, yes, we all hope that Bernie has ignited the political revolution, I mean, but we're not going to know for some years whether or not this is the beginning of a political revolution, because the, the challenge before us is so enormous. It is going to take much more than one election cycle, two election cycles, <coughs> to build the kind of movement that Sanders is talking about. You know, we can we can have all these movements and all these demands, and people are not going to turn out in mass in the off year elections until a new kind of movement is built in this country, and it's going to have to be a movement that is based on organization, and that organization has to be both national and local. It has to be national and grassroots. It's going to take an extraordinary amount of hard work, but that, that's the only thing that's going to turn things around this country, because, the, because this country is so enormous, it is so spread out, and we've got such a messed up political system. That's the other thing, you know, the Democratic Party. I mean, a lot of this, realistically speaking, we're, a lot of this work's going to have to come through the Democratic Party. And it's going, only going to happen if we can have a movement that channels people into the Democratic Party with the goal of changing the Democratic Party, democratizing the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party itself has so corrupt. It is so different than what it used to be. There is no more local political parties except for a chosen few with connections who are involved in fundraising, who are involved because they, they're getting something out of it. People are so totally alienated from the political process. But yet, at the same time, because of our two-party system, because of our messed up political system, the only way it's going to be able to be changed is from within, within and without. And that's going to be, we don't know what Sanders is going to do after this election. We don't know. Let's hope that he will become the leader of this political revolution. That's, but we don't know. We, and, and even if he does become the leader, the leaders can always be chopped off. You know that from the 60s. So this, these are the kinds of things we have to be thinking about. How we sustain this in the long run. And building a movement. Lots of organizations out there, lots of websites, lots of email lists and all that. But they're not we're not building grassroots organizations in the communities, in the wards, in the precincts. That's what needs to be done. Thanks, yeah, finally like that. So I think you know, Bernie actually says it himself. He says this revolution isn't about me, it's about you. And I think yeah. and the right wing <laughs> Also understands the, the point about in it for the long run. Why why is House not going to change this time? Because Republicans spent ten years 
winning elections at the state level and redistricting the congressional district so that they have both they have those districts sealed up for 10 years. So I think, you know, I think it's not about the midterm and that election next time. It's about what are those kinds of movements that are actually gaining traction right now that we can, you know, put effort into. So I think like and I think the incentivizing it as well, like I've heard proposals on the carbon tax that you could actually take the revenue from the carbon tax. Don't put it into infrastructure. That's wonderful. But what they said was you could like give everybody a tax rebate. Right, you buy with the revenues from a real like a carbon tax. So go run on that, but it's probably not going to pass in the next by the next midterm. But make everybody vote on it between now and the next midterm. But I think the other point, you know, like the one to the to the um, incarceration. So the medical marijuana and the cannabis movement, um, state ballot measures passing in states like Alaska and 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 actually 26 states have medical marijuana. So there's and that's sort of challenging entrenched interest on many levels from the, the ground up. So the medical industry, the, the drug industry, on the, the, the amazing medical cures that marijuana is sort of or treatments that marijuana can be used for. Um, the hemp industry displacing plastic, right? Stuff like that that could you know rally around it. Um, another initiative that's going on that I'm with the United Food and Commercial Workers. So we tried to. Um, organized our members around the DARPA to get their our members to go to, uh, to their families and get people registered, um, you know, get citizenship for the people that aren't out there, but that got stopped by the courts. But there's like a, nine to eleven undocumented people out there that who who can apply for citizenship now. They've been there. They 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 have the right to apply now. So we've shifted gears. And are getting those people elected, you know, registered to vote for this election. And in fact, the Trump, <laughs> the Trump, you know, attack on immigrants has actually accelerated that. So I mean, I think there's, and then I think on the the local level, another one we've been working on is um, we passed a, a good food procurement policy in, by the LA school district. It has five sustainability criteria. It took us five years, but we're now to the point where. A chicken contract, we were able to knock Tyson and Pilgrim's Pride out of the chicken contract because of their labor and exploitive um, record on labor and farmers and animals. And those are ordinances now that are being <coughs> steering committees in at least a half a dozen cities where we're working at the local level, like the minimum wage. So I think we have to find starting, you know, the local at the city level minimum wage, you know, levels and build the movement. And it isn't, you know, it isn't about Bernie, it's about us. That's great. Final thing here, Julie, and then we'll give you each a minute. But. Uh, sorry, I'm getting too late. I don't know if you've spoken about this, but uh, like here, we just have to say about about the concept of reparation, which to me seems like that a very uh, important uh, juncture between the political and the economic, like making concrete. The, you know, the look at, at the, the consequences of oppression at odds uh, and you know, structural inequality in on you know, the economic uh, you know, on economic equality. And you know, it can also be to the extent that it's African American, that it's also Native American, and, you know, all you know, it really is a, a, a potentially really small Thank you. Minute each to, to, to respond to any of them. Karen. Well, I'll just start with saying yes, I think that's really important. So, unless we're addressing, um, really addressing the grievousness of having a country built on the back of enslaved Africans, we're not going to get the kind of real change, certainly not, not a political revolution. And, and I'm glad you brought up Native Americans because that too, there needs to be restitution for Native Americans and African Americans maybe before we can do anything else. Um, but that is certainly uh, the beginning or a foundational piece of really achieving any kind of equity in terms of racial equity and economic equity because it is hundreds of years of African Americans and Native Americans being impoverished by deliberate policies in the United States from slavery to redlining to predatory lending. 
through the, of the history of this country, and that has real deep e economic consequences, and it has landed 2.2 million people in jail. So that I think that that's critical, and that's just part of my, my closing statement, is that we can't do any of this if we do not um, take racial justice, racial equity, and ra racial equality into, into account. Uh, well, on, uh, yeah, on the question of you know or, how organizing for to keep the political revolution going or build a political revolution, I don't have a clear answer. But listening to Dennis talking about the innovative work that the labor movement is doing, I mean, what you have in the labor movement is um, a movement that uh, brings people together who have personal connections, who often work together, who go to the union hall together, um, have a clear accountability structure. Um, unions are in decline, and I I feel the, the impact of that all the time. And so I, I just want to throw out there one of my fantasies for what to do with the however million people uh, contributed to Bernie or went to his uh, his rallies is how do we help steer that into some kind of a structure where people continue to have face-to-face -face interaction that builds the kind of relationships that I think really keep a movement together. I think the you know the websites and the online fundraising and all of that is great, but I think we need those kind of ties if we're really going to hang together. And I would just pick up to say I think that addresses the, the sort of hollowing out of democracy that you were speaking to, that that is part of how this shows up locally. and. Um, you know, rebuilding kind of the ward precinct face-to-face -face democracy institutions. I mean, one of the things I think that has actually happened, at least in, I live in the greater Boston area, there are groups of people that have come together around this campaign to do calling together. They've kind of almost formed like affinity groups. And maybe that's where we need sort of the small group structure. Big mega churches understand this. You know, you have 2,000, 5,000 people but you need to have your sort of face-to-face -face small group within that. And I think that's that's a missing element. So I think there's some characteristics to going forward that I think we could learn from. Bernie did that. He had the house meeting with his teleprompter. You know, that's right. His, his so some of those little, so you can use technologies to help reinforce the small face-to-face -face group right. organizing work. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also just say I agree, I think uh, Julie's point about Reparations as a frame is a really powerful in this particular moment. And if you think about the concentration of wealth, the concentration of white wealth, you know, 100 billionaires now have more wealth than the entire African American population, you know, according to an IPS study on billionaire bonanza. So, there, to to repair, to repair is both to acknowledge the history of how that came to happen and. We're living the life. We can't face our history. What can we face? And then, you know, there's actual wealth and assets that should be redistributed. And some of the mechanisms we're talking about is the way to do that, I think. Let me just say one final word John. here on the institutionally uh, about this. Because I think, um, first of all, these are great comments. And I thank uh, deeply my colleagues here who I've had the pleasure to work with collectively for about 80 years here. <laughs> Not quite. 70. Uh, is I think it's like IPS and many of the groups we work with understand that one of the weaknesses on our side is that we've been working separately. And so we are most interested in the spaces where we not only kind of align our agendas, but we work together strategically. And I'll just mention two that I think could be very helpful in this period. One, you were mentioning you got arrested through democracy, awakening and democracy spring. That that is several hundred groups aligning around both of voting rights and a money out of politics and a racial justice agenda. It's also got the uh, reenfranchisement agenda. Um, it's continuing as a democracy initiative where <coughs> hundreds of groups are together in a space. The other one I'll just mention, because it gets to your point about it needing something national, but that is vibrant at a local and state level. We're throwing in a lot of our work now with this thing that each of the people here mentioned. Um, uh, a month ago, three big organizing groups merged. U.S. Action, National People's Action, and Alliance for Just Society. And to something that is called People's Action. And I urge you to go to their website. This is now a group that has uh, affiliates in 32 states, is active in many cities, is fighting on economic justice, racial justice, 
linking climate justice in with these issues, fighting at the local and state level as a national agenda. We're going in and working with them in Illinois and Minnesota and other states, but we're helping them with the national agenda and they're building power from the bottom up. It, it's like Dennis says, and it's, it, 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 this is going to take a while. This is a, a power building uh, stage here that um, we're hopefully can have some wins sooner or later, but the big ones will come hopefully around the 2020 elections um, and beyond. So we've been here for 53 years. We're in it for the long haul. Thank you all for joining us. Now, please do try to come next Tuesday. There, there will be a, several of these. If you're not on our mailing list, get on it out there. And did we get the inequality.org uh, sheet? Has anybody got that, the sign-up sheet for inequality.org? Because we want to make sure. Yeah, we got that. Beautiful. Thank you all for coming.